What we'll do in today's lecture is uh, continue our discussion of the uh, breakup of the uh, jet okay, uh, due to surface tension and uh, these are the equations which we had basically derived in the uh, last class and uh, these are the linearized equations. So, we wrote down the uh, equation of continuity and the momentum equations, we had made an assumption of the jet being inviscid okay no viscosity because viscosity is not the one which is causing the breakup what is causing the breakup is the surface tension and we need to retain that effect and that effect is coming from the normal stress boundary condition so gamma here represents the uh, surface tension is the surface tension so maybe uh, i've actually written this as a new so let me write this as gamma so that's gamma Okay. So, this represents surface tension and uh, what I have done is all these equations are with dimensions. So, in addition to all of this we need to use the kinematic boundary condition. Okay. The kinematic boundary condition we have to derive for uh, this particular problem. How do you derive the kinematic boundary condition? You write the interface F as R minus a times 1 plus epsilon f of z equal to 0 okay and uh, this f of z f is of course are going to be a function of time as well f is going to be a function of time as well and uh, what we want to do is write df by dt equals 0 that is your uh, kinematic boundary condition. Okay. Df by dt equals 0 implies the partial derivative of f with respect to time plus v dot del f equals 0. Okay. f is a scalar, remember f is a scalar. Okay. So, what is df dt? It is just uh, minus a epsilon d small f dt because these are independent variables now okay and i have minus a epsilon df dt plus v is going to be this is going to be given by ur df by dr plus uz df by dz equal to 0. That is your uh, v dot del f term. I got two velocity components u r and u z we are assuming theta symmetry in this problem. Okay, So, there is no theta component. What is d f d r? d f d r is just 1. So, this gives me minus a epsilon d f d t plus 1 plus u z sorry d f d r is 1. So, this gives me u r okay, plus u z times d f d z is the partial derivative of this with respect to z which is I am going to have to multiply this by minus a epsilon d f d z equal to 0 or in other words minus a epsilon d f d t plus u r plus u z uh, sorry minus u z a epsilon d f d z equals 0. Okay. Now, this is the kinematic boundary condition with the actual variables u r and u z the actual velocities. So, this is I have not made any uh, assumption here I am just saying that the surface is of this kind. Okay. And what we have to do now is invoke, since I am interested in the perturbation variables, I have to write this in terms of the perturbation variables. The base state velocities are 0. 
So, this I am going to write as epsilon u r tilde and this I am going to write as epsilon u z tilde, right. So, u r remember is u r steady state plus epsilon u r tilde and u z is u z steady state plus epsilon u z tilde. So, these guys are 0 and when I substitute this here, what do I get? Minus a epsilon d f d t plus u r which is nothing but plus epsilon u r tilde and this is going to be minus a u z tilde epsilon squared d f d z equal to 0. This being a higher order term, that is 0. I mean that is not 0, this is a higher order term. So, I am not, not going to consider this. This is of order epsilon squared. So, that vanishes and what this gives me is u r tilde equals d f d t multiplied by a. Okay. So, that is my kinematic boundary condition. So, if this is the term, this is the equation at order epsilon, what I like to do is I like to add this to my set of equations here, which is basically try, trying to tell you that u r tilde is equal to a times d f d t. Remember the way I have written this uh, deflection of the interface, f is dimensionless because r has dimensions of length and a is here. So, f is dimensionless, okay. So, just to briefly uh, go through, we were we had derived the normal stress boundary condition at order epsilon in the last class and these are the linearized equations of momentum, continuity, kinematic boundary condition we have just derived here. What I did is just use the fact that uh, kinematic boundary condition comes from the material derivative of f, proceeded further, okay and uh, I have uh, got in this thing at order epsilon, okay. We now need to solve this, but before I solve this as it is, what I am going to do is I am going to make this dimensionless, okay. So, let us make it dimensionless and then see what is to be done. So, to make this dimensionless, I need characteristic scales for pressure, velocity, length and uh, time, okay. So, what is the characteristic length scale? We are talking about a circular jet which is infinitely long, which has a radius of A, okay. So, the characteristic length scale is going to be A. LC, I am going to choose as A, the radius of the jet, radius of unperturbed jet. The other thing which I am going to do is I am going to choose uh, for pressure, the, the characteristic pressure, the pressure difference remember at base state is given by gamma divided by r or gamma divided by a, okay. So, if I have a cylindrical jet of radius a, I can choose my characteristic pressure as gamma divided by a because this is my jet is known, this is constant, that is also constant, my characteristic pressure becomes something which is fixed. Hmm? So, once the characteristic pressure is known, I can calculate what my characteristic velocity scale is because pressure goes as rho u squared right. So, uh, my u is going to be, u characteristic is going to be given by square root of pressure characteristic divided by rho, which is 
square root of gamma by a rho. Why is this? Because remember what we are talking about is a stationary jet. The actual problem, the base problem does not have any velocity. I am looking at a thread which is actually stationary. So, there is no velocity which is characterizing the flow. So, I do not have a characteristic velocity from that, but what I am saying is whatever is the velocity is going to be induced by the surface tension which is breaking up. So, that is the reason the uh, characteristic velocity has the surface tension occurring in the um, definition. Okay. And so, now I have my uh, characteristic uh, length scale and velocity scale. So, my time scale is easy to be found out. My characteristic time scale is going to be T c is going to be given by L c divided by U c. Okay. This has units of time and uh, so, I would have a divided by this okay this is right yeah so we proceed this to the power 3 by 2 looks funny but uh, So, with this I want to make the equations dimensionless okay. and uh, what we will do is we will just go through with uh, the uh, process here. Hmm. Let us take the first equation, the first equation is rho times d u r tilde by d t equals minus d p tilde by d r. This is with dimensions. Okay. So, if I want to make it dimensionless, I have to take out my characteristic velocity out of this. When I take out the characteristic velocity, I am going to take out square root of gamma by a rho and uh, I have to find some other symbol. So, I am going to call it d u r star by d t. Uh, where u r star is defined as u r divide, uh, divided by u r characteristic, u, uh, yeah, u r characteristic. Okay, u r characteristic is the same as u z characteristic, and uh, both of them are. So I'm taking out this factor. What about t? Okay, let's do t later. Minus. When I take out my pressure characteristic out, I am going to get gamma by A d p star and when I take out make this, I have just converted this to dimensionless, I am going to make the independent variables now dimensionless and I will get rho times square root of gamma by A rho times take out a t characteristic which is here which is A to the power 3 by 2 times square root of rho by gamma okay, d u r star by d t star. So, what I am doing now is making the independent variable dimensionless. I mean you, you guys can do it faster and minus gamma by a square d p star by d r star. The point I want to make here is that Mm. Okay, wonderful. Everything is fine. So, I have just went from uh, dimension. So, the, the stars represent the dimensionless variable okay, without dimensions. So, this is without dimensions. So, you can see what happens now is this gives me this rho cancels with this square root square root 
this gives me a squared, this cancels with that and this gives me gamma that cancels and I have basically gotten rid of my coefficients which were hanging around. Okay, so that is my dimensionless equation. You can do the same thing for all the variables and we can get our dimensionless equations now. Okay, I am not going to do it for uh, the other variables, but I just want you to know clearly th this is unique because that is the only length scale. This is coming because the pressure difference is given by the surface tension force and I am using that and once this pressure is defined, I can use this to get UC and TC. What we will have when we make it dimensionless is dur star by dt equals minus dp star by dr, okay. du z star by dt equals minus dp star by dz. Come to the next one. I should possibly put a star here. something is wrong. Zero and uh, when it comes to the kinematic boundary condition, you will get something similar. You are star equals star okay and this guy here p1 i'm going to scale with gamma by a so p when that comes out p1 star is going to be given by minus f minus f double prime so you can do that and you can see so these equations are my dimensionless equations remember f is already dimensionless Yes. Yeah, I mean, um, the we can do, we can take a different, uh, but what is the characteristic length scale in the z direction? The wavelength is what we are going to find out. The wavelength of the disturbance, which is most critical, which is going to decide the breakup of the drop, is what we are going to find out. We do not know what the wavelength is. If I had a characteristic dimensions in the uh, length uh, in the z direction, I could possibly use that. If I use that, then that particular length scale would come in the differential equation. Otherwise, it will come in the boundary condition. So, basically, if there are two length scales, depending on how you define, uh, define your uh, characteristic variables, they will come either in the boundary condition or in the differential equation. So, that parameter will appear, but either where does it appear, that is the only thing which uh, is going to be different. Hmm? Okay, so we need to solve these equations and uh, what I am going to do is I am going to drop the stars from now on, okay, just uh, to, so let us drop the stars, but the equation, the variables are dimensionless, remember that, okay. It is just for me to uh, make life easy, otherwise I keep forgetting the star somewhere. Wonderful. So, I am just going to follow what is done in Gary Leal, so that it is easy for you to refer. So, this equation can be solved in many ways, but uh, remember this f is a function of z and t, okay. And our objective is to find a relationship between the growth rate and the wave length or the wave number, okay. So, f is a function of z and t and I am going to seek f as e power sigma t sin kz, 
I could have used exponential, but uh, I am just going to use sinusoidal, you can use cosine, it does not matter. What am I doing? I am looking at a periodic disturbance in the z direction, okay. So, since it is infinitely long, I am just saying it is I have a disturbance in the uh, z direction which is infinite uh, which is periodic. This is growing exponentially in time because my equations are linear and this is representing the amplitude in some sense. The actual disturbances are going to be arbitrary okay and these arbitrary disturbances I am going to be able to decompose them into different Fourier modes and that is the justification for seeking this periodic uh, function in the z direction. So, what I will do is I am going to find out for different k's which for different k values which is the one which is going to grow. If it turns out that for all values of k sigma is negative that means it is not going to grow it is stable. Okay. If it turns out that for some k it is sigma is positive that means it is unstable. So, any arbitrary disturbance is going to be decomposed into a bunch of Fourier modes. We find out which of this is going to grow, which of this is going to be unstable and that is what we are always are going to be doing in this course. Okay. And whenever you do linear stability analysis of infinite systems uh, which are extending to infinity in some direction, this is the approach which is used. If you have a finite system, then you will use a finite Fourier transform in terms of sin n pi x by l, sin uh, pi x by l, sin 2 pi x by l. But since it is infinite, we use the actual Fourier transform. Okay. So, the uh, other thing is I am going to jump directly to my normal stress boundary condition which we derived. So, I can substitute this thing for f here and I can find out what is p. Hmm? So, p 1 turns out to be minus f minus c e power sigma t sin k z minus of f double prime which is minus this is remember the derivative is with respect to z. So, I am going to get a k squared and that is going to be the plus sign and that is going to be given by c e power sigma t sin k z times k squared minus 1 that is my pressure. Okay. What I am saying is if this is the form of the uh, interface the form of the pressure is going to be given by this, but remember this is at I have got this from my normal stress boundary condition. So, this is at r equal to 1. Okay, This is since this is from the normal stress boundary condition. Now, I know what the value of the pressure is at the boundary. What I need to know do is I need to get the differential equation for pressure. Okay. Remember, what are these two equations here? I can combine these two equations from the Navier-Stokes equations and I can write this as du by dt in a vectorial form as minus gradient of p. What have I done here? I have just I am just saying that I can look at these two equations, write this in a vectorial form. The r component is going to be du r by dt is minus dp by dr. The z component is going to be du z by dt equals minus dp by dz. Okay. And remember this is nothing but the divergence of u equals 0. So, I am going to take the divergence of this equation and when I do that, I will get divergence and this is a scalar operator, I mean this is a time derivative operator, the divergence is spatial. I can move the divergence operator inside here and I will get d by dt of divergence of u equals minus divergence of del p. The left hand side is going to be 0, the right hand side is going to be del square p. So, basically I am going to get del square p equals 0. Okay. So, so taking divergence we get 
del square p equal to 0, p 1 for whatever reason I put a subscript 1 here, okay. So, that is my differential equation. I need to solve this differential equation. What are the independent variables z and r? So, I mean um, this is basically going to be 1 by r d by dr of r dp 1 by dr plus d square p 1 by dz square equal to 0. And uh, since it is a second order equation in z infinitely long you, and it is homogeneous, you can seek the solution in the form of some variable separation. You will get some trigonometric function in the z direction and you will get a Bessel function in the r direction, okay. So, basically what I am saying is this solution p 1 is going to be of the form a of t cosine k z plus b of t sin k z. Mm -hmm. times i 0 of k r or i 0 of yeah. So, I mean I am not going to be doing the math here, but you guys can go and check if this is indeed right. Now, there are two things, this is a second order in z, second order in r and uh, you need to have, you will get two solutions, right. It will be i 0 of k r and there will be another solution which is k 0 of k r. You would actually get a, b and let us say c and d, two constants associated in the r direction. Hmm? So, these are your uh, independent solutions in the z direction sin and cosine and since there is a variable separation form, it is going to be i 0 and k 0. Now, the fact that k 0 is unbounded, basically is going to knock, knock off this contribution. This is knocked off because k 0 is unbounded and r equal to 0 and what I am left with is only this, only i 0 is going to contribute, c multiplied by b is some other arbitrary constant, c multiplied by a is some other arbitrary constant. The thing which I want you to remember is the differential equation here has only r and z. So, why am I putting a as a function of time and b as a function of time? The reason is the boundary condition has the time dependency because on the boundary the variable is changing with time, the pressure inside is also going to change with time periodically or, or in whatever way it is. Okay, it may not be periodic; it is exponential. So the reason why this, if this pressure had been independent of time, then A and B would have been just constants. But because the pressure here is actually changing with time, these guys are not constants, but these are functions of time. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this p p one as A multiplied by C, some other constant. Um, which let us say E of t times cosine k z plus f of t sin k z times i 0 of k r, okay. Now, what I want to do is I want to compare this guy has to collapse to this value or this function at r equal to 1 and r equal to 1 this must match this and at r equal to 1 I only have the sine dependency, I do not have the cosine dependency. So, what this means is E has to be 0, okay. So, from the boundary condition at r equal to 1, P 1 equals f of t sin k z times 
is your of k r. Okay, so this periodicity in the z direction is the same as what is being imposed by the boundary condition. The variation in the radial direction has come by the governing differential equation here, and the amplitude f of t is something which we need to find out. Okay, that is still an unknown quantity. But what I have done is I have basically gotten this, okay, wonderful. So now I need to get a relationship between f and uh, c, hmm? and how can I do that? This is a uh, pressure is given, I need to use one of these conditions here. Uh, I do not know velocity yet, I know pressure. Um, I am just going to put at r equal to 1, this pressure must be equal to this, correct? And that will tell me how f of t is related because then I can equate the 2. So, I am going to use this boundary condition at r equal to 1, my pressure is C e power sigma t sin k z times k squared minus 1 equals f of t sin k z i 0 of k r. Am I missing something? i 0 of k. i 0 of k, you are right. i 0 of k. Sin k z goes off. So, f of f of t is nothing but c times e power sigma t times k squared minus 1 divided by i 0 of k. Okay. So, f is known, now I have been able to relate. So, this is what, what we are trying to do is these arbitrary constants which come. I am going to try and eliminate them and try to get it in terms of one constant and then we are going to finally say that that constant cannot be 0 and then get a relationship between sigma and k squared. Huh? Okay. Otherwise, you can keep all those constants, write a determinant and say that the determinant should be 0 in order to get a non-zero solution. So, either approach is fine, but we are going to do it this way. Hmm. If f is known, then what is my pressure? My pressure is going to be given by? I am substituting this f back there, c e power sigma t times k squared minus 1 sin k z times i 0 of k r divided by i 0 of k. I am going to use my radial component of velocity balance okay, to find out u r star. So, the plan is this, substitute for differentiate with respect to r, find out dp by dr, I will get dur by dt and then from this I get u r. Once I know u r, I can substitute the value of u r here. I already know what f is, I have assumed it to be of the form that find out what this is because the kinematic boundary condition is yet to be used. So, idea is I am going to get u r in terms of c, I am going to get f in terms of c and everything will be fine. Okay. So, let us find out what is uh, d p by d r is going to be c e power sigma t. Differentiating i 0 gives you k times i 1 okay. and uh, this gives me k times k squared minus 1 times sin k z times i 1 of k r divided by i 0 of k. That is d p by d r. Okay. 
So, see, first. yeah, I'll, k comes here, this is what I get. And this remember is du r by dt is a negative of this, this is a negative of this, this quantity here. So, to find out u r, I am just going to have to integrate this with respect to time, okay. I am going to integrate this with respect to time and I get u r equals, when I integrate with respect to time, I get the sigma in the denominator, right. So, c times e power sigma t divided by sigma k times k squared minus 1 times sin k z times i 0 of i 1 of k r divided by i 0 of k. So, all I am doing is integrating this with respect to time and I get e power sigma t divided by sigma, okay. Beta minus yes, is a minus sign because there is a minus here. Dur by dt is minus dp by dr. Wonderful. We are pretty much done. And this, remember, at r equal to one must be at r equal to one. U R star equals minus df by dt. Okay, this is going to be equal to R equals minus df by dt. Minus df by dt or plus df by dt. It's plus, right? Why do I write minus here? Is it plus? Okay. Yeah. So, what is plus df by dt? Remember, f we have already assumed to be of the form c multiplied by e power sigma t. So, df by dt will be sigma e power sigma t times sin kz. So, u r will be equal to this, I have to evaluate this u r at r equal to 1, okay. And I yeah, just check, the plus or minus, it is plus, okay. So, u r is equal to c sigma e power sigma t uh, sin k z at r equal to 1 and I just go to this equation here and I get c minus c e power sigma t by sigma times k times k squared minus 1 times sin k z, k So, right now what I will do is I will just erase this plus d and I will justify to you as to why we are neglecting this d, okay. This must be equal to c sigma e power sigma t sin k z from the kinematic boundary condition. So, e power sigma d sin k z cancels and c has to be non-zero, remember, okay. So, what do I get? c has to be non-zero implies sigma squared equals 1 minus k squared multiplied by k times i 1 of k divided by i 0 of k. for a non-zero k, for a non-zero c. If you want a non-zero disturbance, basically we are looking for a set of conditions when your uh, linear equation has 
a non zero solution linear homogeneous equations have a non zero solution and if this condition is satisfied you have a non zero solution okay so what this tells you is what is the growth rate for different k's so basically this answers the question for each wave number k what is going to be the corresponding growth rate okay so this tells you and if you want to plot this function on the right as a function of k you would uh, be able to get the dependency of sigma squared on this so let's do that so if you plot sigma squared at k equal to 0 k equal to 1 this thing is 0 that's k equal to 1 in between k equal to 0 and k equal to 1 this gets positive okay if k is greater than 1 sigma squared is negative if k lies between 0 and 1 sigma squared is po uh, positive so for 0 less than k less than 1 sigma squared is positive which means when you what, what, what we are really interested in is sigma okay and that means sigma will have be plus or minus square root of a positive quantity so will have a positive value and a negative value okay so this means sigma is positive for this range and again for k greater than 1 sigma square is negative and actual thing is the, it is uh, neutrally stable because the real part is 0 what this means is if you are going to see and then you also see that the maximum growth rate is going to occur at some point in between some wave number in between is the one which is going to grow fastest okay so when you give an arbitrary disturbance it is going to be made up of different wave numbers or different wavelengths the wave number which is going to go, grow fastest is the one which is going to dominate and that is the going to be giving you the indication for what is the breakup length for example because k remember is wave number which is reciprocal of wavelength so this particular thing you can calculate and if I remember right this is about 0 0.6 okay so what this means is the maximum growth rate occurs for sigma uh, for k equals 0 0.6 approx approximately this is right 0.6 Jason you think 0.6 is right 0.6979 okay 0.697 so that's almost 0 0.7 then okay now what does this mean the wavelength that you are going to observe the lambda critical when surface tension is going to actually pinch and going to you know break this uh, thread which is stationary the lambda critical is going to be given by 2 pi divided by k okay and uh, it is going to be given by 2 pi divided by k which he tells me is 0 0.697 so I will just go with that 0.7 but remember this is all being done in dimensionless so the actual length is going to be a times that okay so it is going to be 2 pi actual wavelength is going to be 
2 pi divided by 0 0.7 times a. I think the jet is unstable when the wavelengths are larger than 2 pi a because k goes from 0 to 1, k is less than 1, lambda must be greater than uh, 2 pi by k. Hmm? So, that is basically this tells you that the wavelengths which are actually unstable are larger than 2 pi by a. Any disturbance which is having a wavelength which is lower than 2 pi by a is going to be stable. Okay? But that we cannot really conclude from this, we can only conclude about the instable uh, portion. Um, what else do I want to say? What we will do in the next class is try to get this upper bound using another method. Okay? This range of wavelengths where you can decide the stability and instability, the threshold value. We are going to uh, derive this using what is called the energy work principle okay? to derive the uh, critical condition on wavelengths. That uh, argument is slightly different from that approach is slightly different from what we have done now. In the sense that is more of a static argument, we do not use the dynamics. Okay? So, idea is that what we have done, the linear stability analysis is we are beginning with the actual governing equations and we are getting the uh, condition for stability, we are finding what the growth rate of the disturbance is. Okay? The time dependent factor is actually captured in the linear stability analysis. In this approach, the time dependency will not be captured, but you are going to use some energy argument and you are going to find out your critical wavelength for stable, unstable behavior and then we will compare these two approaches. Okay? That is the idea. So, uh, we will answer this question about this integration constant being uh, 0.